Azerbaijan is bound on the east by its long Caspian seashore, which runs from one border to another. To the north, it is girded by the majestic Caucasus Mountains. The south of the country is subtropical, and central Azerbaijan has long, vast plains. This is my country. Any country, be it small or large, is always enormous to those who live there. Because its spread is not simply geographical, it goes much deeper into the history, culture and traditions that have been created over centuries. And last but not least, into the tastes developed by the people who live in that land. And the history of Azerbaijani cuisine harks back to the furthest of ancient times. However, cuisine, its development, enhancement of flavor, aesthetic perfection, does not depend solely upon the beauty of a land, but also upon its diversity. Nine of the 11 climate zones can be experienced on the territory of Azerbaijan. Favorable conditions for the most varied flora and fauna to thrive. Thus, the cuisine comprises over 2,000 dishes, the core of Caucasian cooking. We begin in times when gastronomic delicacy was the last thing on people's minds. This is Gobustan, an internationally renowned historical and archaeological reserve 65 kilometers from Baku. The first shoots of civilization did not appear in many places on Earth. The first settlements here were sometime around the Upper Paleolithic era as suggested by the small dwelling sites snuggled between rocky ravines and caves. The enormous boulders huddled up to form a natural hideout. For whole millennia, they were shelter and stamping ground for the ancient settlers. From here, they went hunting and sea fishing. And these rocks also gave birth to artists. They believed that cave paintings brought their tribe luck. So for future generations, they depicted the most ancient image of boats built of rushes, adorned with a representation of the sun. This is almost 10,000 years old. But even with the most vivid imagination, we would hardly find the beginnings of our cuisine here. People knew nothing then of taste and its nuances. It was the last thing on their minds. They were omnivorous and fighting for their lives. Among the many depictions of animals that they hunted and worshipped, there are bezoar goats. We were astonished by one observation from our culinary specialists, and it is time to surprise you too. This cave painting shows the butchering of an animal for food. It is absolutely identical to images used in teaching today's cooks. And this was drawn around 12,000 years ago. They collected water and prepared food in these holes cut into the rocks. They heated the water by lowering into the holes red hot stones from the fire. Maybe they also cooked complete dishes in these holes. And yet again, how small is man in these vast expanses? The desire for a settled life, 
was not something that appeared overnight. It took centuries. But it is a settled life that produces taste for food, the variety and nuances of taste. This is an excavation in Goitepe in the Tovuz region. The oldest cultural layer here goes back 9,000 years. This is the most ancient Neolithic dwelling in the South Caucasus and dates from the 6th millennium BC. The archaeologists work with admirable care and precision. It is like a sacred rite, a divination as they reveal the past. Here we witness the next step in the rise of civilization, when a nomadic hunter settles down to till the land and raise cattle, for the first time in history working to bend nature to his will. This settlement, surrounded by a sun-dried cob brick wall, is magnificently preserved. This can truly be called a home, lived in and cosy. They kept and cooked food in ceramic pots. They crafted tools from obsidian and bone. The Goetepe excavations indicate that 9,000 years ago too, people lived on the meat of cattle and small ruminants, poultry and pork. The only difference is that now these are all domesticated animals. These excavations also revealed grains of barley and wheat, witnesses to significant developments in farming. Mankind had already entered into a settled life. But for now, let's return to the legends. This is a harsh sacred monument from the past, Gemi Gaya, Boat Rock Mountain. This is another of the ancient people's dwelling sites. Rocks with pictograms are scattered all over a vast area. A kind of unique chronicle left by the settled farming and animal breeding tribes that lived in the foothills and plains of Nakhchivan from the 4th to the 1st millennia BC. People here are convinced, and this legend has travelled the centuries, that this is where Noah's Ark touched dry land during the flood that Noah and his sons founded the city of Nachchivan and that the city's name translates as the place of the arrival of Noch, Noah. There still exists a pier or shrine, a mausoleum in Nachchivan that was a site of pilgrimage in ancient times. Just look at the photograph. Later, this place was renamed Noah's grave. That is the beauty of legend. It always brings God's blessings. The legend of Noah has it that a grain fell from his ark onto this blessed land and yielded fruit. Thus, Nachchivan became a blooming oasis. Since then, it has been famous for its fertile soil, orchards and pure springs. This land does have sanctity about it. Pilgrims flock from all over the world to visit the Ashabul Kaf cave complex that is enveloped in mystic legend and is mentioned even in the Quran. Once, some holy men fell asleep here to wake up 300 years later. And no one really worries about how they lived for centuries without food or water. The spiritual dimension has its own otherworldly law. Azerbaijanis deem bread to be holy, regarding it as a boon sent by God from heaven. And you will still find Azerbaijanis swearing by bread, touching it as a sacred object. I swear on this bread, they say. The sower now began to look for vast fields to cast the blessed seed. 
More bread meant more people. The world slowly filled up. There is an immutable tradition for preparing to bake bread. One has to do special ritual washing, and one has to start work thinking heavenly thoughts, in mind and in heart. People have made many different kinds of bread in Azerbaijan over the ages. Yucha, fetir, lavash, senga, khamrali, tender cherek. It is difficult to list them all. But these names are mentioned in sources from the 10th to 12th centuries. Perhaps the true variety of Azerbaijani cuisine stems from its bread. It is almost the main indication of settlement. One initial comment on our adventure into Azerbaijani cuisine. In Azerbaijani, the names of dishes almost always correspond to different stages, forms and methods of cooking. The recipe is always encapsulated in the name. This applies to bread. Take lavash, for example. A lavash means bread on fire. In the city of Agdam, in the Karabakh region, there was until recently a bread museum. Its exhibits included petrified grains, as ancient as Azerbaijan's culture of crop farming. Currently, the museum is beyond reach in lands occupied by Armenia. Interestingly, we use very little vegetable-based oil in Azerbaijani cuisine. Could the reason for this be the advanced culture of animal husbandry, in which milk is central? Our cuisine, from pilaf to dessert, is inconceivable without good dairy butter. The people of these lands have long used special butter churns to produce butter by hand. In the south, they used clay jars in which they rocked a fermented milk base to produce a thick, tasty and slightly salty butter. In the north, they mainly used cylindrical wooden butter churns which they hung up to rock. The rhythm of the rocking determined the butter's taste. Village butter is still produced this way, called nechwe butter, it is named after the churn it's made in. And now it is time for tea. Tea is special in the lives of all Azerbaijanis. It travelled here somewhere around the 1st century BC, along the Great Silk Road from China. For centuries, it was delivered here from the Far East. But towards the end of the 19th century, the subtropical zones in the south, Lenkaran and Astara, as well as regions in the northwest, began to grow their own tea. Azerbaijan is now one of the 30 countries that produce tea. By the 10th century, there were already special tea houses in Azerbaijan, and the chai khana is still extremely popular. The most delicious tea is rightly considered to be made with water from a samovar. The oldest samovar in the world is made of clay and has survived some 4,000 years. It was found during archaeological excavations in Sheki. The working of a samovar 
is a key method in culinary history. The fire burns inside the vessel, thus affecting the taste of the water being boiled. In our culture, a tea party has become a true ritual, which requires drinkers to linger and savour their tea, creating a special state of the soul. Tea is served in a traditional glass, an aumodou. Thanks to its shape, the tea stays warm for longer. No one can remember who invented this glass. And some even see in its shape a woman's waistline. Perhaps this is why conversations held with tea in hand are so inspired. It's customary to serve a variety of pastries with tea, probably because tea parties became a part of palace culture. The stars of the sweet feast are, of course, the intricate pastries. Paklava, Shekebura, Sujuk, Gatlama, Alana, Shekechere. Each one requires pinpoint skill and patience, and even art, in their making. The patterns on the Shekebura, for example, require special tongs or pincers, Maggash which are used to pinch an elegant design on the oven-ready pastries. To take a look at these tongs that originated in the 17th century, let's travel to the town of Yeni Shamahi in Agsu region. And we will marvel again at a new discovery. This medieval architectural complex has stood the test of time very well. It was home to crafts and trades, including metalworking, dyeing, weaving, pottery, glassmaking, and bone and wood carving. The city had extensive trade relations, not only within its vicinity, but also with European towns. Among the exhibits found in this region are glassware, elegant porcelain, as well as bottles of expensive wine. The local nobility had ordered them from London and other European cities adding an elegant European serving aesthetic to the Eastern table. This city was destroyed by the Russian army early in the 19th century during war with the Azerbaijani Khanates. Many more secrets are probably still buried here. In general, Azerbaijanis are not a drinking nation, but human curiosity and ingenuity are unstoppable. They didn't only order table wines and other drinks from abroad, but were, for example, quite familiar with wine from ancient times. The archaeological excavations in Uzeliktepe settlement turned up vine seeds, i.e. grapes that were specially grown, from the late 3rd and early 2nd millennia BC. The site also had spinning tools made of stone and vessels for fermenting and storing wine. The fossilized wine in Shemachi Museum is estimated to be 2,300 years old. After the adoption of Islam, winemaking went into decline here and people grew grapes mainly for the table. However, a new wave of interest in winemaking arose in the last quarter of the 19th century. Azerbaijani wines and brandies were awarded diplomas and medals at fairs, very much in vogue back then, in Paris, London, Bordeaux, Munich and other cities. Another rather interesting fact is that alcohol was also produced here by distillation in ancient days. The first material evidence of the distillation of ether oils and alcohol was found in Gebele. They were made using this clay device back in the 7th century. This skill has been preserved. And the taste of vodka is probably still the same as centuries ago. Arak, vodka, was made from the mulberry, cornelian cherry and other berries, 
However, these araks were mostly used for medical purposes. Arak means white drink. Ar is white and ar is drink. On the other hand, ar can also mean pure, from the word arinmish, purified. For centuries, they have grown dozens of kinds of rice, mainly in the subtropical plantations in the Lenkaran zone. Khan rice was famous all over Azerbaijan. Pilaf. It is the crown of Azerbaijani cuisine and a perennial favorite that is served on both holidays and days of mourning. Pilaf can even be cooked without special occasion but then that day becomes a holiday of sorts. There are over 200 kinds of pilaf, each one different in its principal ingredients, cooking method, special aroma, serving style and accompaniment. Side dishes of meat, dried fruit, herbs, fish, poultry and nuts are served with pilaf. The golden oily gazmar, a fried crust of dough or lavash, and rice formed into a heap. All this makes a feast for the eyes as well as the stomach. Azerbaijanis can hardly be called sailors or excellent fishermen. However, they have always had a taste for fish. The rivers Kur and Araz with their delicious freshwater fish. The lakes of Goigol, Jeyran Batan, Goicha, and of course the Caspian Sea with its sturgeon, black sea roach and zander have enriched our cuisine with magnificent fish dishes. Many courses of fried, stewed, boiled and stuffed fish grace our table. But one item remains unchanged. A special and most delicious sauce, now sharab, made of ripe pomegranate seeds, is served with every fish course. Pomegranates occupy a particular place in our culture. The great poets considered it the most mysterious and enigmatic of all fruit. It is even called the king of fruit. It is no coincidence that God gave a crown to the pomegranate, as our people say. In years of plenty, this juicy, delicious fruit literally bows its tree to the ground. The pomegranate, a symbol of fertility and prosperity, was heaven sent to this blessed land. It seems like everything grows here. Rosy gubar apples and fragrant pears, juicy peaches and apricots, cherries and the sweet baku persimmons, the large honey figs and several kinds of cornelian cherry, quinces, tangerines, oranges, fragrant lemons and all kinds of nuts. We couldn't possibly list them all here. Indeed, almost anything could be grown in the gardens of Azerbaijan. They are abundant, even in years of bad harvest, because different fruit have different reactions to the whims of the weather. Yagut al-Hamavi, a 12th century Arab traveler, was made giddy by such abundance, being a man of the desert. There is a huge number of different fruit trees in Azerbaijan. I have never seen so many orchards and so many rivers and springs as I have here. And there are so many different spices, everything from cinnamon to saffron and cumin. There were even special saffron gardens laid out around the Baku fortress in the 19th century. Later, they were edged out towards the northern shores of Absheron. And today, we produce abysmally much less than we used to. There are a number of recollections by European and Russian travelers, historians, ambassadors and merchants of their visits to Azerbaijan in the past.
they were mesmerized by the abundance in these lands, their fertility and miraculous beauty. But it seems they were most amazed by the cuisine served up in the palaces of the Azerbaijani rulers, which is quite understandable. It echoed the palatial beauty and harmony. The carpets, so precious and bright with all the colors of the rainbow. The magnificent manuscripts, decorated with miniatures, painted by the greatest Eastern artists. The fabrics and embroidery. The woodwork, embellished with fretwork and inlay. And precious bejeweled plates. The cuisine matched this luxury. The preparation of these dishes was lengthy and laborious. And these viands were the equal in elegance and richness of the soft carpets and magnificent silk tablecloths that they were served on. Anthony Jenkinson, the 16th century English traveler, wrote with admiration of his visit to the Shemachi ruler, Abdullah Khan. The tablecloths were laid on the floor and different dishes were served. They were served in various courses. I counted around 140. When they were taken away along with the tablecloths, they brought in new ones and served a, a further 150 dishes with fruit and other festive viands. So, in all, 290 dishes were served in both sittings. The Englishman's admiration is not of excess. It was probably admiration of the abundance. The travelers were fascinated, not only by palace cuisine, but also by the nomadic culture, which presented completely different methods of storing and cooking food. This food was purely natural, but no less tasty. However, the most popular dish of all eras uniting all levels of society and satisfying all, even the most pernickety tastes, is the kebab, shashlik. Alexandre Dumas, the 19th century French gourmet and writer, declared, the kebab is the most delicious meal I have come across. We must include it in the list of popular dishes in France. Dumas would be very much surprised to see how popular the kebab has become all over the world. Humanity's oldest meal has long since boldly broken through all national boundaries. Any famous Azerbaijani gourmet is also a sage, ready to philosophize for hours about our cuisine. And it truly is a source of pride. Every season's gift is a rich harvest that is reflected in the cuisine. For example, in winter we cook mainly flour-based dishes with meat. Summer is the time for vegetables and cultured milk products. All is of crucial importance in cooking a meal. The cook's energy, their voice, the inner state of mind with which they handle the ingredients and the, the aesthetic environment. Experienced gourmets say that even the cook's sweetness of voice and mood can influence the taste of the meal. They say that some meals should only be prepared while in an elevated mood. Sometimes the cook even needs to sing. Today, cookery may indeed be called an art, and Azerbaijani cuisine is mentally and spiritually intertwined with all forms of traditional art including music. For from the Earth's childhood, the first ever sounds, the first songs and the first dances were the sounds, melodies and moves associated with the rituals of finding and preparing food. Azerbaijani cuisine also urges the use of ingredients, including vegetables and fruit, that grow in the locality. Food carries certain coded information, they say it influences the person, their spiritual and physical state at some genetic level. Food, the vegetables and fruit that are close to our hearts, for their smell, taste, color and consistency, 
and that were grown in our homeland, absorbing its juices, salt and energy, can impart to us, in full, the energy of that land. And to conclude this short journey to the world of Azerbaijani cuisine, we will come to the essence. Doesn't matter how luxurious the dishes are that adorn the table and what fancies the cook has recourse to while cooking. The only benchmark here has always been the guest. The word gonag perver, hospitable in Azerbaijani, has a deep and poetic connotation in our language, centering on the guest. Every host flits around his guest like a butterfly around a candle. And at times, it seems he is ready to burn like the butterfly, just as long as the table presented is to the guest's liking. The guest is always served the best food, and the guest's wishes are taken as law. If cuisine is a door to our culture, then this door is always open wide to any guest. Welcome to Azerbaijan.